when someone hears the word of the kingdom. Listen, when someone hears the word of the kingdom. Only God knows what will happen. I remember once when my middle sister Lori and I were teenagers, maybe it was when I first you know, came back from my first year at college. I'm not sure exactly when, but we were in the house and we were talking, just you know, sharing something. I don't remember the topic, and and I put some phrase like "God bless you" or "God willing" or something, God ish, into the conversation, and my sister exploded with a tirade against that one little phrase. And I was totally taken aback. I faltered as I tried to explain. I didn't mean anything by it. I wasn't trying to convert her or teach her or be, you know, I wasn't trying to be self-righteous or anything of that nature. I was just, it was just some words that went in the sentence, you know. I think at the time I just chalked it up to sibling stuff and she didn't want to hear about God at the moment. And, and I remembered not to mention God too often in her presence after or for a while after that. But, as I was reflecting on these scriptures and I was reflecting on the power of the word of God, I was reminded of this incident. I haven't thought about it for years, so it just kind of popped up there, and that tells me I need to pay attention to it. And so as I prayed about it and looked at it, I look at it now as a demonstration of the power of the word of God. I didn't mean anything by it. I was just thoughtlessly repeating a phrase that the word of God itself had a power to confront and cause a reaction deep inside my sister. And Isaiah warns this, warns us that this will happen. Just like the rain and snow come and cause the seeds to sprout, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The word of God alone has the power in it. Why does that surprise us? How many times have we heard the story of some atheist who's studying the life and times of Jesus in order to denounce and condemn Christianity, and they experience conversion in the midst of their study? How many times has an actor or writer been just doing their job, portraying a biblical character or a Christian, and suddenly they become a believer? There was no one there to convert them. There was no intentionality of conversion going on. All they came into contact with the word of God, and that was enough. That word of God rang down upon their spirit like God sends the rain to water the earth. And the word of God planted the seed. The word of God watered that seed and brought about its miraculous growth without any human intervention at all. The word of God has power. It shall go forth to accomplish God's purposes. It's amazing. It's a miracle. And it's something we should praise God for because sometimes our words fall far, far short of what they need to be, as that instance with my sister shows us. In this particular section of Matthew, there's a focus on parables. Parable is a Greek word that means something cast beside. Something cast to the side. It is something else to help explain or to clarify. Well, thanks be to God that Jesus spoke in these parables because we deeply need to see the word of God with much more clarity. Parables are used to disclose a new truth for us. Best of all, parables make you think. Lots of teachers just spit facts out at you, wanting you to memorize information and to be able to repeat it back for the test without really thinking about what that information means or implies or what it can do. The best kind of teacher teaches you things in a way that makes you think it out for yourself and come to your own conclusions. And so when Jesus shares these parables, we can take them in, and we each might take them in in a different way. And Jesus' parables were wonderful because they have withstood the test of time. And they have continued to inform us and transform us throughout the ages. There was a totally different world back in Jesus' day where you walked everywhere and there was dust everywhere and there was no air conditioning and homes were all one level. And you know, and now we have you know, internet and satellites and cell phones and you know, 
know, televisions and, and all these wonderful things that they didn't have, but parables still speak to us today in our culture and where we are. And that's a marvelous thing. These parables give new meanings in new situations. And like music or a poem, they don't have just one meaning, but they can have several. And sometimes for us, as we grow and as we learn more, we can pick out new things every time we hear the parable, even though we've heard it 20,000 times. We are still learning something new from it, and that's the, the glorious wonder of a parable. So Jesus came to change the world by revealing the deep love of God for all humanity. And these parables help us to take the familiar and go with it to a new place. You know, for those people in that time, sitting on that beach, listening to Jesus in the rowboat, they knew what a sower did. They knew about throwing seeds out. They knew all about the planting and farming. And yet, somehow that planting and farming got from seeds literally in the ground to seeds and human beings and a whole kingdom of God growing. The parable takes you to a new place. It challenges us and helps us to grow in the reality of God's love. That's pretty awesome. We generally think of this particular parable, the, seed, the parable of the sower, as an evangelism parable. Jesus is the farmer who sows the word of God in four different types of soil. So the seeds he's sowing are really the word of God. And some of the soil is so bad, the word can't grow. Some of the soil helps the plants start to grow, but then they die. And then there is this good soil in which the seed takes root and grows and produces fruit even up to a harvest of a hundredfold. And they're not sure the commentators differed on what a hundredfold might be, but one commentator said a hundredfold could pretty much guarantee that the farmer got to retire and move to that beach permanently. <laughs> so it's a vast and incredible harvest, and it's miraculous um, on account of God. And our comfort is if this is what happens when Jesus sows the word, Jesus is throwing the word of God out there, and some people hear it, and they don't understand it, and they turn away, and they don't take it in. Well, then we're comforted because we know when we share the word of God, and it fails to take root, we need not be discouraged. If that's what happens to Jesus, we know it's going to happen to us. We need to be like Jesus and just keep throwing that word out there willy-nilly, every which way that we can. And sometimes, yes, we'll have the discouraging and despairing uh, responses, as I did that day with my sister, to the word that we spread. But we just keep spreading it. We don't know what, what will happen to it. And we need to remember that the results are not dependent on us, but on the power of the word of God and the power of Jesus, who is the word of God. Our job is not to convert. Our job is to spread the seed, and then we leave the rest of it to God. But it's important that we spread the seed. You never have the hope of growing those cucumbers or those zucchini if you don't put the seed out there. And we'll never grow the word of God, or we'll never, never grow the kingdom of God if we don't continue to spread the seed to share the word of God. Nothing will happen and that won't be good. There is power in that word. And God and that word of God will do what needs to be done to help our brothers and sisters in this world come to know God's God. To sow the word of God every which way is something that Jesus taught us. And we, we don't know their culture, and so it's sometimes hard for us to understand this. But when the Hebrew people sowed the word of God, it was basically within their own community. They read the word of God on the synagogue, in, word of God in the synagogue each Sabbath day. And you only went to synagogue if you were Jewish. You know, like a wandering Gentile just didn't walk in. You know? So it was a pretty much closed community. And then um, they would teach their young men in Hebrew school. And that Hebrew school may meet out underneath the tree, and a Gentile might happen to walk by and hear the word of God as the, the rabbi was teaching it to the young people. But, you know, that, that's happenstance. That's, that's an accident. You, you didn't hear it on purpose. But the sharing of the word of God was kept pretty much close to home, from Hebrew to Hebrew and synagogue and in their town. But when we look at the life of Jesus, he began to spread the word. There was the Roman soldier whose, whose child was healed. There was the, the Samaritan woman at the well. These are not Hebrew people. 
There were other Gentiles who heard the word as Jesus began to scatter it abroad to all kinds of people. Paul, the great evangelist we read about in all the letters that follow the Gospels here in the New Testament, Paul was a great speaker and philosopher. It was the custom of the day to provide entertainment and education by standing in the marketplace and pontificating your point of view. And you might even get a couple other people who didn't believe what you believed and so you get a whole debate going. And so everybody would gather around to see how this was all going to happen. Once Paul was transformed and the word of God got a hold of him, he broadcast the word of God to the masses of Gentiles in the marketplace. Some heard and came to believe. Others went away doubting that a seed was planted. And who knows when it might start to grow. Some seeds can remain dormant for quite some time. Some seeds only open after they've been through a fire, or they've been soaked in the water of a, a, a floodplain. Or some have to go through the intestines of an animal before they will sprout. So it's important to get the word of God, the seed out there somehow, some way, and God will help it to germinate and grow. In medieval times, the church produced traveling scripture plays. Uh, they would get a, a cart or a trailer together, pull it behind some oxen, and go from town to town. And the actors would put on a play of a, a scripture story or a parable. Um, you really didn't understand the word of God in church because only the educated knew enough Latin to get the gist of things. But the plays were done in their native language. So it was wonderful. And everybody would gather around. There's no TV. There's no internet. There's no satellite. There's no nothing going on in your town at night. And so in would come the, the traveling players. They would announce, you know, there's going to be a play of Adam and Eve tonight in the, in the town center. Everybody, good, devout Catholic, lapsed Catholic, Jew, Muslim, whoever, would show up to watch because there was nothing else going on in town. And they all overheard the word of God that was scattered in the towns by these actors. In more recent times, evangelists came to be called came to something called a camp meeting. This is what America is favorite it is uh, its its contribution to religion is the camp meeting. These were big affairs put on during the boring summer months when all the young animals had been born and the crops were growing and you really didn't need as much attention in a farm community as in the spring and the fall you need lots and lots of work and attention. But in the summer, everything's just kind of growing and you kind of watch it happen. So it gets kind of boring. Well, this is when they would have a special preacher come to town and every evening, everyone in town would gather for the singing of hymns and the preaching of the word. And even if you didn't come and sit underneath the tent, the preacher's voices went so loud, even without microphones and sound systems, that you heard them on the edges of town. So you overheard the word of God, even if you didn't go to hear the word of God. Well, then as time progressed and culture progressed, the clergy could write articles for the weekly newspaper, or did a radio broadcast of the Bible study or church worship service, and the word of God is sung willy-nilly in the world. And then with the development of television, the word of God was spread abroad and so via the televangelist, and then movies and TV shows. And now we scatter the word of God via the internet. And who knows where that will end up and who will see and hear the word of God. Last month at annual conference and this coming week at Youth 2011, they're going to have um, Twitter. And you can send out a tweet with a little short message an announcement sent out via your smartphone, and uh, then they have ways that you can comment on what has been going on. And so it was really funny. I was sitting next to a clergy person who was doing her tweeting, and she showed me some of the comments that people were making about what was going on on stage, and it was quite fun. We had a good time um, trying to figure out the tweeting and the Twitter and all that good stuff. An annual conference was live streamed again for the second year, and what a blessing that was to Bishop Kammerer, who was sick and couldn't lead us in the annual conference, but could watch from her sick bed at home. The annual conference was filled with Bible study and worship, and so again, the Word of God was so really, really in the world. And here at Silverbrook, we have a web page. Most people use that to check us out before they ever step inside the door. They can see our worship times, whether we have a nursery, they can see if we have Sunday school or a youth group, and they check it out or check out our calendar and our pictures to see what kind of events they do. And that's the way people check out churches. They don't have to go church shopping, they just sit at their computer and check out their website. So if you don't have a website, God help you. 
I don't know how they're ever going to get checked. We reach people all over the world with this website. Soldiers can check out the website and keep in touch when they're far from home. Grandmas and grandpas can check out the pictures to see how their grandchildren have grown. You can check out the website and see the sermon and catch um, Sunday school notes when you're on vacation. Carolyn just told me that her parents watched from New Hampshire. So when we did our series this past Lent and Kevin had started up the sermons on YouTube, we discovered that there were people in New Zealand who had watched the now famous Seven Deadly Sins sex sermon. So you never know where the word of God will go. Um, it, we surely have started a new thing here with websites and internet and satellites. So the word of God is going about the world willy-nilly. And we put things here on our Facebook page. We do have a Facebook page in case you didn't know that. And we can put links to the sermons on YouTube on the Facebook page. Um, we put notices about upcoming retreats. And sometimes I put up questions and comments about the sermon so we can get some feedback going back and forth. Uh, sometimes there's reminders about upcoming events like the hot dog thing. You know, I'll probably put that on the Facebook page. And uh, so that people will know what's happening here at the Kingdom of God in the Silverbrook United Methodist Church and Retreat Center. And so the word of God is sown around the world. That word of God has power. It goes forth from God, and it shall not return to God empty. And that word of God shall accomplish that which God purposes, and succeed in the thing for which God has sent it. Thanks be to God. Amen.